I thought it would be 4K now when I said <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad to be here again and in, and in this role. Uh, just put together a presentation on, on exactly this, because I saw in the program that was what you had given me, merging mobile broadband and the internet, and that suits well, because that is what we are doing. And uh, I have a few slides on exactly that top because that is that is very much what is happening right now for for many reasons and basically just because people don't like wires so if you can be wireless you want to and if you want to be with global reach and coverage you want to do that also the interesting thing about us being here in uh, in uh, california again is the, to combine the the ericsson leadership in mobile communication with the, the silicon valley leadership in, in internet and ip and that is something that has been coming for quite some while. And then if you really look at it, we, we have been working towards that for, for a very long time. And that's why we, the majority of the people that we have now is, uh, is uh, acquired companies, like Redback and uh, for routing, Entrysphere for GPON. And also we have a resource from Marconi in Silicon Valley and also some of Tanberg. We've also relocated our research that we had in RTP over to uh, San Jose and now, so we've concentrated everything there. So about 1,200 people in R&D in, uh, in San Jose. And um, I will come back to it maybe later, but just to simplify it, if you, in the mobile world, we almost, I now exaggerate a lot, of course, but they, we almost could control the mobile world between Stockholm and Helsinki. Ericsson did the network, Nokia did the phones. And, and that, that was it and then the, the rest of the world had to, had to follow. Now, uh, that is no longer the case. I don't know if anybody from Nokia here, raise your hand. But uh, anyway, I think that the, what we have seen with the iPhone, what we have seen with the, the Android phones and what Google is doing, and also now when we get embedded uh, 3G modules into all the laptops, how the laptops become part of the mobile networks, it is much more now the, the dominance on the application and device side is coming from uh, California and Silicon Valley and not from the other side of the Baltic Sea. Still, however, the network part is coming very much from, from Europe and from Ericsson. I, listened, I, I saw the Eric Smith from Google. He gave a speech in Barcelona last week or two weeks ago at the big Mobile World Conference. That is the big, big, big thing in this industry. Uh, but he basically said, thank you, Europe, for bringing mobile telephony this far. Now we take it from here. Uh, that could almost be true on the on the device and application side, but it's definitely not true on the on the network side. If you want to be a little bit blunt, it's almost the contrary. We we do not see so strong presence around the world anymore from from Motorola, from Lucent, from Nortel. Uh, it's swing the other way, but but it's really on the device and the application side. It's clearly. And then if you go into the IP and routing again, very strong uh, strong. Uh, competence and presence here in Silicon Valley and in California. And uh, so you look at the, uh, some of the research that you presented out here uh, on, on that same topic. So it's really about uh, uh, combining these two words that we're trying to do uh, in, uh, in our office uh, in Silicon Valley. There we have allocated uh, the, the whole broadband and IP operations of Ericsson, both the product area and the development unit, even though the resources might be sitting in other parts of the world. That is where it's being run from San Jose. Uh, so uh, the whole network division of Ericsson has three basic product areas, and one is the IP and broadband, all being run out of San Jose. That's basically what this slide says. <laughs> I will usually say that there are four reasons for us to be here, and these are all summarized in this slide. One is uh, if you start in the, in the lower left corner, the converged networks. With the convergence of IP, internet, and, and mobile is happening now. And as I said, a lot of that is happening here in, in California, and that's why we are combining that. The other part is the, the green, that's the device and application, I already addressed that. The, iPhone, the Google, the Android, that's also happening here. That's why we need to be here. Third uh, corner up to the right, partnerships. We do not do everything ourselves anymore. We used to do our own CPUs in our switches, what was called APZ. We used to do our own programming language, that was called Plex. And we don't do that anymore either. Now we rely on partners. And those partners are companies like Intel, HP, Oracle, Sun, IBM all of them present in, in uh, California and up in, in Silicon Valley. Also a reason for us to be here. 
And the fourth corner, Ericsson in America, we, we are now the major vendor in, in North America. We, we started off 2009 being about three 4,000 people. We ended by being 14,000 people. Uh, and uh, there's only one part of the world where we are more, and that is in Sweden, where we are 19,000. So it's basically in ballpark the same as we are in Sweden. This is by far our largest country now, or North America, if you need, also maybe include Canada. We got a big outsourcing deal from Sprint. We acquired uh, Nortel's uh, CDMA, LTE, and GSM business, and we got a contract with Verizon on LTE. Of course, we got continued business on LTE, also with AT&T. So we are now the supplier to Verizon, AT&T, to T-Mobile, Metro PCS, Leap, uh, and uh, Rogers. We have basically no, all, I would say all operators now in North America are customers to Ericsson. So that's a, also a major reason for us to be here. So, so the convergence of the networks on our product side, the knowledge of what's going on in the application device side, the partnerships with soft, embedded software hardware uh, with our partnerships, and then our presence in North America, both as an employer and also as a supplier to all the operators here. So things have changed a lot. And that's why for the first time, I think we established uh, one of the main group functions of Ericsson here. And I am sort of part of the Ericsson management team, but I'm based in, in San Jose. Then we are doing, zooming in on what we're doing here, the research we're doing. We have about, Ericsson research is about 600 people, and we are working with all the, the technologies. We have been basically see ourselves as very much of innovators of GSM3, GLT. And we have leading IP competence and active in the standardization organization there, and work with lots of concepts that we deliver and prototype test pets and so on. And Ericsson Research also fights about 50% of all the Ericsson patents. If you really look into the ones that we make any money of, they are, all come from Ericsson Research because they are the early ones. Uh, so uh, it's, it's in fact a, a good, a good uh, part of our business also. We do not make as much money from IPR as other companies, more with local presence here in San, San Diego, but we still have make some money. And, and in Silicon Valley, we work with packet networking, open application environment, and radio access. So there, it's all led by Jan Söderström. We started very much around, around the IP, but then we also led to, to, uh, to the access and now with the, and, uh, and the open applications. And thirdly, now when we move the research group from RTP, it's also even access, radio access. And of course, with the GPON business, we have also fixed access. So it's all three disciplines that we have now, beginning to be a very sort of multi-competent group uh, with very, very very good uh, people that Jan is running up in, in San Jose. Here we have that in a, in a more visual picture. Started with the packet technologies, went on with service layer, and now with access technology. And uh, these are some of the, of the partners we have, UCSD and Stanford, and HP Labs, Google, and Carnegie Mellon. Uh, re but we have ongoing research projects. And, uh, Myself, I went to Stanford in 1984 to 1995. That was 25 years ago, so I'm glad that we're now cooperating also with, with Stanford, if I can say that in this room. <laughs> Some of the work we're doing together with you started in 2001, must have been, but we probably agreed in 2000, because uh, I think it was in March 2001 that this, things went bad. And we, we worked with a radio network test, but I was very much around the work with Magnus, Magnus Almgren. IP networking and, and security work. And uh, now we have renewed our commitment. And we have even tighter cooperation and results dissemination, thanks to our local presence in California. So now it will be easier. We took an early flight this morning, Jan and I, and came down here. It's easier than going for all the way from Sweden. And then we have the Center Wireless and CNS memberships, and uh, going into cloud computing also. That's an, an interesting area. And uh, I think that is an area with lots of uh, bus and things. I will not go into that, but that's of course, uh, lots of things would be very important there. But sometimes people tell me that how all the mobile phones in the world would be part of that. And I think that would be a, a bit of expensive uh, access to use. It will be a while before the rake receiver and the mobile phone ends up on the cloud. Because it's sort of uh, like, like uh, well, how would you do that? You need that before you can even detect the signal. Another important part, and, and, and that is also sort of in, in, in competition with the local companies here in Qualcomm, we have ST Ericsson, 
And I, that is an important part of Ericsson strategy, but also an important part of the whole industry, because uh, everybody in the industry wants to have two suppliers. So ST Ericsson is a very interesting component in the whole ecosystem to be an alternative to Qualcomm. And, and we are deliver, of course, to, to phone, the phone industry, but also to the notebook industry. That's a 50-50 joint venture between ST Microelectronics and Ericsson. It's called ST Ericsson. So on Ericsson, there you see also that the second logo there is 50-50 a, is a between Ericsson and Sony. So by Sony Ericsson, we are part of the, of the device industry, and that through that part of the application industry, through ST Ericsson, we are one of the few companies, I would say, in the world that are on both sides of the air interface, with the base stations and with the ships. Very few others are, if you think about it. And, and, and that makes us very interesting as a partner for lots of, we, 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 I notice that every day I get contacts from companies uh, up in the, sort of the venture capital part of, of Silicon Valley that wants to work together with Ericsson, uh, because we are seen as the leading company in the whole wireless world. And that, as I will come to very soon, is becoming very important. <clears throat> we had this vision about 50 billion connections by 2020, and I, I, why 50 billion, and what is uh, connected, and what technology, I think we will see, but that is, you have to sort of put some stake in the ground a little bit further than 7 billion people, because then you think, then you have all, soon the, the, everything is saturated, soon everybody has a mobile phone, and then you think, well, that's the end of that industry, but there is sort of more coming, and uh, I think we're doing something pretty unique right now, and, and with with LTE, uh, that is uh, multi-megabit, Verizon is going to build it, uh, AT&T is going to build it, uh, MetroPCS is going to build it. So there are sort of lots of companies that will sort of we have contracts with here already with LTE. And with, for the first time, I think, well, we have it with HSPA, but uh, with other with also with LTE, we will have an a invisible connectivity layer with multi-megabit capabilities. And, and uh, that's only the imagination that stops you what you can do with that. What will, what will people think about as applications to try to make a business out of that connectivity? Layer? Everything that can benefit from being connected will be connected through that. And then you can just start from there. We, we, we used to connect, today we have connected about 400 million households in the world. That is to say that two people per household on average has almost one billion people connected fixed. There are 4.6 billion people connected mobile or wireless. So it's four to one mobile to fixed. And that will continue also when you go into mobile broadband. It will broadband connections will be four to one mobile to fixed. So the majority of all the internet connections will be mobile and wireless. What does that mean? And then we, have, we are going from connecting households to connecting people to connecting devices. And then we come to these 50 billion devices. And there you can see it's very blurred what is fixed and what is, what is uh, mobile in the future, because everything will basically be wireless. And then you just have to find the shortest way to the closest antenna and then into the fiber. This is how the fixed world has developed over the last, say, 20, 30 years, 20 years it is, uh, with the access speed and the capabilities of the edge routers. And if you plot as an X what has happened on the mobile, it is exactly the same just about 10 years, 7 to 10 years later. So whatever you could do, we fixed 7, 10 years ago when we started, when we first signed this contract, that you can do mobile today. And, and that is being realized. So everything, if it started with the cellular networks with the mobile phones there, went to, into mobile. And then fixed phones went in, TV audio, and now the, the whole... Uh, broadband access, everything is going into mobile broadband to a very large extent. IPTV is probably still what's going to be on fixed. But that's sort of the, that's sort of almost like the, the game. You had your fixed line, and then came GSM, and they said, oh, I can now, now I can give up my fixed line. And then, ah, you need it for DSL. Okay, I will keep it a little bit longer. And now comes mobile broadband. Okay, now with mobile broadband, I can throw away my fixed DSL line. Ah, wait, IPTV is coming. Now we have to keep it. So... And then will be this 4K will come, and then you have to keep it again. <coughs> well, it's sort of um, there's always a race where mobile is always catching up, as you saw on that one. But then there's always something else coming that makes you keep it. This is though the 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 number of subscriptions in the world. 
going forward. You are all engineers and smart people here, so I will not say that this slide contains forward-looking statements that you usually do when you talk to financial analysts. But we all know that 2015 is in the future. Um, you see that about 80% will be, uh, uh, be mobile and even more. The majority of the bits might still be in the dark blue and not in the green, as for IPTV and 4K and so on. But the, so far, the, what you've been paying for is per subscription. So the majority of the money will still be in the green. And, and that's why mobile is becoming so important. Technologies, I will not dwell upon that, but I saw there were some pro there always some projects that are discussing. I think that I've been doing this for a very, very long time, and there's mainstream technologies always wins. And I just, the only thing you maybe want to highlight there is the yellow one. It's quite a lot of hype around that yellow one, but that will not be a big thing. But it doesn't really matter in the research project, because you can always go with broadband or OFDM or something, and then you can use it both for LTE and for YMAX if you want to. But the, the, the big thing is going to be LTE. But for a very, very long time, it's going to be HSPA, the, the light blue there. The light blue and then the, the dark green. But there's also got a lot of life still in the red there. CDMA, we will have that for a long time. Verizon will keep it for voice for a very long time, even though they will move over a lot of the date down to LTE. So you will see the blue and the red survive for a long time, and you will see the green coming. The rest, uh, more of a question mark. As I said, it will be data and data and data. And as I summarize it, that voice is noise, uh, even though you make money. I was on my final slide, you will have some about the money. Uh, so there's still a lot of money in mobile uh, voice. But it's nothing that you have to really worry about when you dimension the capacity of the networks. Because an average person in the world talks 300 minutes. In the US, you talk seven, 800 minutes. Some operators, you have, they talk 1,500, I know. Uh, some even maybe more, but on the average in, the, in Germany you talk 70, I don't know why, uh, but in, uh, in average that comes up to 300 minutes. How much is 300 minutes? That is 20 megabyte. How much is a decent PowerPoint presentation? Nowadays it's 10 meg usually if you see a PowerPoint. So it's, you talk, in the whole month all you can do is talk two PowerPoint presentations. You only have to synchronize your mailbox and you have four of those. So sort of voice is not so much anymore. But uh, so you have to go into to, 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 to data. That's the growth. And of course, maybe you will not have the same margins in the data as you have in the voice. Well, that's fine, but then you should stop with voice also and only do SMS, because that's even more margins than SMS. <clears throat> so that is sort of our predictions how, how it will grow. What, what is actually happening in, in real life? This is real life data. And there you see, this is from 2007 to 2009. The red is voice, and the green is data. The low bars that grow very quickly, that's 3G, and the higher bars that are being caught up with, that's the 2G. So if you see, if you go back only to 2007, which is not that far ago, long ago, then, then, uh, then it was not so much 3G, and it was almost only, only voice. Now it is uh, almost as much voice as data, almost as much green as red, and the same amount on 3G as on 2G. This is in the whole world. And if you go back one slider and look at 2009, it looks like it's almost more green than blue in this one. So it should be more data than, than voice even. So why isn't it more green than, than red in this slide? Well, it depends on the fact that this is taken during estimated busy hour traffic, and busy hour is for voice. If you take it over the 24 hours, it would, in fact, be more green than red now. And this, if you then look at how fast has this green been growing, it's been growing by a factor of 15 in two years. That's 12% per month. If that continues like that, and that's a big if, then, then it will grow another tremendously amount the coming five years. And if you go back to 2007 and compare to 2014, in those seven years, it will have grown a factor of 1,000. Well, it starts growing from a quite small number, so maybe it will not be like that. This is not a factor of 1,000. It's, a, it's less. But that's just a pure mathematical if it just continues as it has done the last two years. But I've been checking the months that have been since this was a September of 9. I've been, I'm continuing to check that every month, and it's still 12 months, 12% 12 per month. So it hasn't stopped yet. 
So, 1,000, can that really happen? Uh, so we have 4 billion users. This is just pure math now. You will find it easy. Of course, this is not always what it will be like, but this is pure math. Today we have 4 billion users generating these 20 megabyte per month in voice. It only takes, of course, 20 million users generating 4 gigabyte per month to come up to exactly the same amount of data. And 4 gigabyte per month, that is what a fixed line uh, broadband user is using easily. In, in the 3G networks in Sweden, people are also using 4 gigabyte per month in the mobile broadband. So it only takes 20 million users to, to come up with the same amount as the total population is doing in voice. So what we have spent 20 years building in voice, we have now done in 18 months on data. And then, of course, if you want to play with it, say, late, let's say that all these 4 billion users become mobile broadband users, and that will happen in five years. By five, in five years, maybe you're consuming 20 gigabyte on average instead of, of 4 gigabyte, and then you are up to a factor of 1,000. So that's the only point is that this factor of 1,000 is not impossible. It could, it could easily happen. And to that, we have to add all these 50 billion devices that are sitting there. Some of them, of course, very, very low-consuming devices, something on my boat saying, but your boat is now drifting away. Okay, that's not many gigabyte. It's only a few bytes, and it ho doesn't hopefully happen that often, so it will not impact these statistics dramatically. But maybe you have some cameras on the streets of London with face-detecting devices that are trying to track down terrorists or something. That could generate a lot of data, so you never know. There are uh, different applications among those 50 billion connections. So this was, how long does it take to grow a factor of 1,000? I already answered that question. It takes seven years if you do that 12% per month. And uh, yes, there is a little note again if there was any financial analyst in the room. This is just the pure, pure mathematical extrapolation and no future prognosis from Ericsson. Um, so where do we find the factor of 1,000 then if we need to find the factor of 1,000? First of all, just going to HSPA NLT instead of Wi-Band CDMA, or going to EVDO instead of CDMA, for that, for that matter, gives a factor of 10 in, in uh, inefficiency. Because instead of, if you go back to ones of you that were, in the, were involved in the CDMA discussions in the early, early 90s, the big thing was the fast power control. And the fast power control is to help somebody falling down in a fading dip, to raise the power to help that poor guy coming out of that bad spot. That is, of course, a terrible way of using resources because you just increase, increase interference to help the weakest person. Instead, with HSPA or EVDU, you look for somebody who, is, uh, who has the best signal all the time and give all the resources to that one. And you come back to the one that is in the fading deep a little bit later because sooner or later you come out of it. And for data, that works better. It also works for voice, but then you have to be a little bit less patient and wait. Then it will not get a factor of 10, but you will get a little bit anyway. I usually take the analogy with, uh, with students. A teacher that spends all his resources on trying to wake up the sleeping student will, over the time, pr produce less results than the one who talks to the one who's most alert all the time, given that everybody wakes up after a few milliseconds. Sometimes students sleep for longer, and then they will miss the whole class. But generally, that is how HSPA works. So that gives a factor of 10. Then uh, going to MIMO and, and other things will give you uh, other improvement factors. We will go from about 1 bit per hertz to 2 bits per hertz uh, on average over the cell area. Uh, and that will give you a factor of 2. And then we will get more spectrum. That we're working hard on getting more spectrum all the time. The digital dividend and up in the 3.5 gigahertz and, and so on. If you find everything we need, so to say, we might get up to a factor of five in spectrum. So then we have 10 times two times five, then we're up to 100, now we only need a factor of 10 more, and that we have to do by doing more base stations, which is good, that's our business, part of our business anyway. This is where I ask the analysts to start listening. Um, however, uh, this will not be maybe the big ones, this will be smaller ones, which of course is even better because that means that the operators did not have to invest so much in big steel towers and stuff. They can spend even more on the electronics. And then I asked them to write that down also. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's we might get to a factor of 1,000, but we, we will also find ways to solve it. So there is a slogan you all remember. Uh, then uh, to the peak and where the traffic comes from, and that could be interesting for some of you doing uh, the power amplifier research, how much, how much load is there on the power amplifier uh, over, 
over the day nowadays. Uh, this is uh, how the how the peak hour is for voice in the top and how it is for for data on the lower part. So you see there is a more pronounced busy hour for voice than it is for data. Data is more widely spread. And the peak, power, peak hour for data comes around 8 to 9 o'clock in the evening, while for voice it's in the, it's in the early afternoon. <clears throat> then the next slide, I have a correlation between the number of users and the number of gigabyte, basically. And not surprisingly, people are awake when they talk. Basically, that's what this slide says. There's a very strong correlation between data and number of users, because everybody has basically the same speech coder. Um, so, in the, when people sleep, there are no users and no data. If you go into data usage, however, it looks like this. The light uh, blue is the data and the dark blue is the users. So, in the evening when you come home, people want to surf, they want to buy movie tickets, they want to uh, buy, book their airplane tickets and so on. Lots of users, but not so much, well, a lot of data, but not as much. Then people kick off their peer-to-peer -peer downloading of e movies. And, and go to sleep. And you see there's a lot of data going on until 3 o'clock when the movies have downloaded and everybody is sleeping. So there is, there is a, a more uniform utilization of the, of the data network and, uh, and uh, when you look at these gigabyte numbers, sometimes you have to think about when do they happen? Do I really have to worry so much? If it happens in the middle of the night somewhere out in the residential area, it's maybe not so bad as it happened in the middle of the city at the middle of the day. As long as the people that want to book their airline tickets and movie tickets not get sort of kicked out before somebody's downloading a movie. So you have to start thinking, what, 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 how can I throttle my network? And then you end up in the network neutrality discussion and what is allowed and what is not allowed. Can I prioritize? It? Maybe if I cannot, I cannot discriminate, but maybe I can prioritize. I don't know. That's maybe this at the same thing. When you're standing there with your frequent flyer silver card in front of the lounge and you're not allowed in because you're only allowed gold members, do you feel, do you feel uh, discriminated or do you feel prior, prioritized when you have a gold card? I don't know. It sort of depends how you see it. Um, anyway, this is if you then look at the data traffic, what kind of data is it? And that's sort of comes back to what I also said. The web is when people are awake, of course, because you surf better when you're not sleeping. And, and then the peer-to-peer -peer is very uniform over the, over the 24 hours. And then you have some other unknown and other. But uh, basically, streaming and web surfing when you're awake, peer-to-peer -peer and, and uh, when you are uniformly over the days. And this peer-to-peer -peer downloading of a movie, if that downloading is ready by 3 o'clock at night or by 6 o'clock in the morning, doesn't really matter so much. So that, that traffic maybe you could shift. So if you look at this, this is basically the same data. Uh, if 60% of the data is peer-to-peer -peer and, uh, uh, sort of, and the other is, say, web surfing, the, the light blue here, when you saturate, sat, saturate the power uh, there between the 6 and uh, midnight, basically, that also hits the light blue because you have done no prioritization. But if you could say, say well, let's um, prioritize the light blue web surfing so people can book their movie tickets or, or airplane tickets in the evening there and let the dark blue slide into later in the night, then you can utilize the resources that you have there in the middle of the night without really impacting the performance very much, the perceived performance by the users that are web surfing in the light blue. And everybody is a little bit more happy. And you use that power there in the middle of the night. Because radio base station power is like, uh, like sunshine. You can't really save it for tomorrow. So you might as well use it in the middle of the night there. But if you really get really good at that, then your power amplifier will be saturated all the time. So then you have for what is the optimum point for a, for a power amplifier uh, efficiency, for instance. So maybe you could have to take all these things into, into the equation when we start looking at uh, these things. So I think that could be some f interesting research. Then when you come further into the network, it's, uh, it's quite different what kind of uh, traffic you're going on, and that relates very much to the device you have. These are four different networks, and then what kind of terminals you have in the, in the network. And then on the y-axis, it's the signaling. RON stands for Radio Access Network. And on the, on the x-axis is the traffic load. So you have, typically in the yellow, you have devices that are very 
you do quick sessions, typically sort of a mobile phone with the GPRS and maybe even only an edge connection. You don't even have a or a, you don't even have a really fat pipe. While in the dark blue here down, then that's almost they have laptops with built-in USB with built-in 3G modems, and the uses are very very similar to fixed. So there you have a lot of data, not so much signaling, and there are. There are three things you have to think about when you have a, the quality of a broadband network. One is the, the coverage, one is the backhaul transmission, and the third is really that you have enough signaling uh, power uh, or computational power in your node so you can take care of all the signaling that's going on. So I, I sometimes simplify and say that running, the yellow, running a network with the yellow kind of devices, that's like running a McDonald's door. You have, you have to have a counter with 50 people standing there taking care of people. Short sessions, people buy for $5 and then they leave. While the dark blue people come in, they sit for three hours in the restaurant and, and they spend $100 and one waiter can take care of five tables maybe. So one is, if you go back to old telecoms, the, the, the yellow one is a lot of busy hour call attempts but very short mean holding time. You need a strong, a strong uh, signaling system and a small group switch, while in the lower one you need a strong group switch and not so much signaling. In the mobile broadband, you need both. Because there is, people move around, you have to do a lot of signaling, the handover and all that. And you have, devi you have devices that are quite sort of chatty, so to say. And you have, at the same time, in the same network, um, users with laptops who just sit and, and do big, big data sessions. So the combined knowledge of both is very important. And that's a good thing for us because we have a lot of tradition in the yellow and we have acquired a lot of competence in the blue through uh, our uh, Redback acquisition. So we, we believe that that would be a good point for us, the whole edge routing business, uh, uh, where you have to address all these aspects. Then the final slide I have here is about uh, where is the money then? Because you always did. Is, is, is mobile broadband going to be anything, or is, isn't that going to be a bit pipe, or, or will the operators really survive? And, and if the operators don't survive, will the vendors really survive? And, and all that. This is the total money uh, in, for fixed and mobile operators, plus cable TV, broadband, and voice over IP. Basically, the whole thing. You can see the fixed down there is fairly flat, but the circuit switched normal voice as you know it, where you have your PSTN phone number that is gradually going down, being compensated by voice over IP and IPTV. On top of that, a fairly flat fixed broadband. Those one billion subscribers will not be so many more. Uh, to the extent they become more, maybe there is some uh, price, price war there also. And then you have the corporate data on top of that, also fairly flat. Mobile voice stays fairly flat uh, to the extent that prices are coming down uh, and people talk more and uh, it's very sort of quite good price elasticity in, in mobile voice and then the, the growth is really mobile broadband going from some 200 billion US up to 500 billion US so there's a 300 billion US dollar growth in mobile broadband then you might say well I don't have the same margins because if you remember the voice is noise slide you don't have to ship that many bits to get the 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 mobile voice money as you have to do to get the mobile broadband money. So the margins might be different. But that's, that's life. You have to go to where there is growth. And the growth is definitely in the mobile broadband. And if you don't want to go there, then you shouldn't do voice either. So then you should stay with SMS because there you have even better margins. Because uh, there you pay about 800 to 1,000 times as much per bit when you send an SMS as you do when you make a voice call. Okay, that was my presentation about how mobile broadband and um, or internet goes mobile and what the implications will be. Some uh, challenging areas. The whole access will grow maybe a factor of 1000 in needs. You will be able to handle, you need to handle both a uh, lot of signaling and you have to handle the throughput and in the end of it it all handles a lot about latency keep the latency down and all this has to be happening in a very very cost effective way because uh, people aren't going to pay more than 30 dollars or something in the end uh, for your mobile broadband connection maybe average in the world 
Maybe here you're paying a little bit more, but I think some 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 are coming down. In, in I think in in Europe has gone a little bit wrong to start with now. You have to sound, find a way to get up a bit because you're almost down to $20 for a mobile broadband connection. That is a bit low. People appreciate mobile broadband more than they pay for it. But of course, some, as long as somebody's willing to give it away almost for free, you take it. But uh, in the end, I think that uh, there would be... It is... It is uh, competition has driven it so low, so it's almost too, too cheap in many parts of the world with mobile broadband. So we'll see what happens. Okay, I'm open to questions. If that, if we have a Q and A, then I'm open. Thank you. Well done. Thank This, this data is from fairly congested networks, but I would say well, quite well-built networks. So, because there are uh, some networks uh, have, do not, for instance, have enough backhaul capacity. Some networks have problems with coverage. So, in fact, you see other problems than the problem you think you see. Because um, if, you, if, if you have a, a, a wideband CDMA network with uh, one carrier and three sectors, you can you can run, say, about 60 vo active voice users per sector at, a, at an 8 kilobit voice coder. So, it's like, so basically, you can run half a meg per sector. This is one and a half meg going back. That, that you can run with one T1. Then if you throw in HSPA there instead, suddenly you have 10 times more. And you sit there with 15 meg coming into the base station and only one T1 going back, and then that's the bottleneck. And then you think you have a problem with the fact you're just trying to run the whole thing through a little straw. So then you have to upgrade that with fiber, 10 T1s, or microwave or something. Um, so the, sometimes some of the, the data you see when people are doing drive tests and so what you measure and what you think you see is, is probably not the, the, the root cause. But it's true that uh, as if you go back to telephony and the old airline formulas and so on, to, you, you try to focus on keeping the blocking below a certain level. So when you want to make a call, you should be able to come through. Uh, on a typical though, carrier, that means that you don't want to get out of, up to saturation as you drop calls. So you can usually load a, a carrier with up to, say, 60, 70 percent with voice. And then you can fill up the rest with data. And if you do that in a very clever way, you, you will run your, your uh, if you can run this, into this PC hour, you will run your your amplifier pretty saturated because you just fill it up with, with data. Uh, and, uh, and if you do it also in a clever way, you should not drop any calls. Then again, you have to see what, 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 which vendor you have for the equipment. There are vendors out there that cannot do that in a clever way. They have to allocate power, half of the power to data and half to voice. And then you come down even lower because then you have to have, the new saturation level comes much lower. So there are, this is, Quite uh, quite complicated, but uh, I I'd say that the full network neutrality to its full extent will probably not help here. You will you will have you will have to give operators the tools to be able to control different kind of of uh, traffic streams. Voice in one category, web serving maybe surfing in one category, and then just some peer to peer. Uh, file sharing in one category, streaming yet in another category. Streaming is quite sensitive. You're even more sensitive to, to, to delays. There you don't want to, to lose the, have a 10 second dropout during the 100 meter final in the Olympics, for instance. Then you lose the whole thing. So it's, uh, it's, 
I think you will have to come to some, some way of classifying this. But this data, as I come back to your question, was from fairly well-built network, but with very high traffic load in them. Yes, yes, yes. You have to, first of all, you have to be able to, we do deep, deep, or different kind of packet inspection. So, sometimes it's all called deep packet inspection. I don't think you have to go deep on all kinds of traffic. It's quite easy to recognize a voice pattern because there comes like 30 bytes every 20 milliseconds and you don't have to be a genius to detect it. So that you can sort of separate that voice as one stream and then you have to do other things. But be able to do that and, and separate that. And I think also on top of that, being able to charge differently and prioritize. But as I said, the, when you dimension your network to handle the, exp the exponential data growth, voice will become noise. So it will be quite easy, I think, to handle the voice. The thing is, how do you then, in, within the data, you will have to also do uh, to detect uh, and be able to separate out different kind of streams. Well, the there are plans, if you look at what is being uh, sort of worked on in ITU, there are, it, first of all, it varies ar 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 around the world today how much you have. I think the one that have most available spectrum is Finland with 550 megahertz, and the least is maybe, I think, Peru or something with 100. And then what is sort of estimated to be needed, or what you, I mean, you can, of course, you can have, you would like to have as much as you can, but what is estimated to be needed to handle the, this growth, considering all the other technologies that are coming, is that you need some, some uh, 1,500 to 1,700 megahertz. So Finland would need three times more and, and, and Peru would need, would need 15 times more, but somewhere there. And there is quite clearly allocated spectrum. Of course, the best spectrum is uh, below one gigahertz, where you get best, best coverage. There, uh, uh, for natural reasons, there is not more than one gigahertz, below one gigahertz. So the, so. But, and the uh, TV still wants to have some, and military wants to have some, but maybe there you can find some, some uh, three, four hundred below. And then it is the, the, around the 900 we have, around the 1.8, 2.1 giga. And the two gigahertz, you have one, 100 mega at 2.3 and almost 200 at uh, 2.6. And then there is some more being discussed above 2.6 in the 2.7. And then there is... Uh, some 200 mega in the 3.5, and there are discussions also above in the in the 3.8, 3.9 gigahertz range. So when you sum up all that, that is uh, that that will all in all become some uh, 1500 megahertz. But either it's not so good spectrum uh, that is sort of high up there uh, in the like 3.8, 3.9 gigahertz, or it is better spectrum, and then it's usually already taken, like most good things in life are. So then you have to find a way to negotiate and, and who should be there. Broadcasting is a very inefficient use of spectrum. It is like printing all the papers in the world in one big, 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 and distribute to everybody. That's quite inefficient. You wouldn't need to do that in the, in the paper industry, but in broadcasting, you basically do that, to distribute everything to everybody, and that's very inefficient. Okay, uh, first of all, I think in, in, if it was here, M to M meant machine to machine. So that is sort of back to the 50 billion connections and, and lots of devices that will start to talk to each other. Uh, mobile to mobile, however, that's, that is an interesting area because that's coming up very often in, 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 in discussions and with research. And uh, especially when you go to, to the more like governmental applications, police, military, and so on, you want to have this sort of walkie-talkie function. That is 
mobile phones are not designed for that because then they have different up and down links. So, so uh, there you have to do it through the network anyway. But that that we have solutions for. But uh, in this context, it was more seen as machine to machine, and that's a that's an important aspect that comes in addressing different verticals like government, the health sector, and and, and that uh, that I know you are working on here in in uh, in the Cal IT also. That Johan can answer mean precise, but say it's in the right now it's in the order of fifteen. Oh, plus ten that we took somewhere else, so it's twenty-five now. It's been growing, twenty-five. Good. I think long term we will uh, get there, but it will be a long detour over other industries, I think. Because that's been discussed for I don't know how long. I mean, Parrot working on that a lot. Uh, and uh, we, we did research on that in, in Lynch Open University while I was there in the 80s. Uh, uh, it, it usually requires, in the end, a very homogeneous group of users, like, for instance, the military, where you where you don't really. But if otherwise, it's it's quite difficult. Just for I mean, I was almost emotional or others. You don't really want somebody else to be jumping over your phone, or you you are the only one. You are the one with a big big park, and you are the one that happens to sit at the end of the park on the park bench reading your book, and the base station is behind you, and you find the whole park is using you as a channel to get to the net, to the network. And your battery can just see your battery go down, and you you haven't even made a whole a single call, and after one hour, the battery is dead. If you are one soldier in, in, the, in the army, you, that's a collective group to start with. And I think other, other groups like that, it has to happen there first. And if it sort of gets established as a working technology, maybe it will eventually come in. Because in the end of the, at the end of the day, to get really high uplink speeds, you cannot take very long hops. You have to be quite close to the antenna. So, because the, there are health reasons why you have a limited output power of a, of a device. And, and as you go to higher and higher bit rate, that, energy, that power gets distributed over more and more bits, so every bit gets less energy. And, and that little bit flying in the air will have to fi fight the background noise, and that's the same, unless you at the same time try to cool down uh, the, the, the temperature of the, of the environment. Uh, so you, as you go to higher uplink rates, you, your distance that you can reach will be shorter and shorter. And at the end of it, you might find that the only way to do it is to jump over others. But it, I think that that is a, it's still a bit away. You will find others. You will find antennas on lamp posts and things like that, uh, and use still quite fixed infrastructure uh, to to do it uh, instead of starting using each other. Because that's not reliable enough. You are an you are an operator. You're offering a service. You are charging for it. And if you're then relying on that there are some other people around that you're also charging to make the whole thing work, you will get a bit nervous. You will prefer to put out some antennas there and guarantee your service. Thank you, Okay. Thank you.